Thanks, Sherry, and hi, everyone. Yeah, I'd like to start by saying a huge thank you to NWAC for putting on this fantastic event. It's great to be back here for the second year in a row. Uh, so yeah, what I'm going to do today is provide an update on a research project that I've been involved with for the last couple of years. And while I'm the one here talking today, this work is really the product of a, a collaborative effort with my um, research partner, Anne St. Clair, as well as our supervisor, Pascal Hagley, and with contributions from Carl Klassen and Robin Gregory. So the question that we've set out to ask and explore is, could the Avalanche Bulletin be more effective? The reason this is an important question to consider is that each year, in the US and in Canada, 90% of Avalanche fatalities are non-professional members of the public engaging in self-directed recreation. And this presents a particularly challenging public safety issue because these recreationists are voluntarily going into the mountains where there are few mandated closures and where they're responsible for their own avalanche risk management. The effort to promote safe planning and travel practices um, in the backcountry is a difficult, <laughs> a difficult situation for people on both sides of this exchange. So for on, on the one side, uh, for avalanche forecasters, they're required to provide unbiased, consistent, and accurate information uh, to an audience that really varies widely in terms of its skills, knowledge, and experience managing avalanche risk. And those on the other side receiving these messages are tasked with determining which parts of the bulletin are most relevant for their trip objectives, uh, transposing the information that they see into a mental picture of what's going on in the mountains, and then making decisions in an environment that's really, really challenging and characterized by uncertainty and in which the costs of mistakes can be extremely steep. So to help overcome these challenges on both sides of this exchange, uh, it's really important that we consider the different ways that avalanche bulletin information is being used. And so we set out to do this using an evidence-based systematic approach. Best practice in risk communication really emphasizes the importance of knowing your audience. So our aim is to get to know the recreational audience in ways that go beyond just demographics and activity types, and aims to understand them in terms of how they use the bulletin. So therefore, we explicitly examined how users find, interpret, and incorporate avalanche bulletin information, and we look for distinctive patterns that could be organized and classified into an avalanche bulletin user typology. This offers a much clearer perspective and a better understanding of the backcountry audience that really and ultimately helps us to improve the effectiveness of avalanche bulletins. So this slide shows the structure of our research approach, which is split into three distinct phases. So uh, firstly, in phase one, as Sherry said, I was here last year presenting on some initial insights from, from some interviews that we conducted uh, in the spring of 2018. And the aim of those interviews was to really try and identify the main patterns of bulletin use. Um, in phase two, we conducted an online survey in spring of this year to see how those patterns are distributed across the broader backcountry population. And then in phase three, we're going to design and test some alternate uh, designs to see if they uh, resonate more effectively with each of these different patterns. So today I'm really excited to be able to present to you some final outcomes from phase one, and I'll also give an update on phase two and talk about some plans for, for phase three coming up. So I covered this in detail last year, so I'll just go over again briefly how we structured these interviews. So we used an interview script which enabled us to explore um, participants' background and their planning process and the information sources that they tend to use, and their typical role in travel decisions. Um, and we conducted all of these sections prior to introducing the Avalanche Bulletin so as not to introduce bias. Uh, we then engaged in a really in-depth conversation about bulletin information. We asked users to show us uh, what do they tend to read, what do they tend to click, uh, what do they tend to pay attention to. And we also had some practical activities, such as using the Autovox 3D mountain model, where we asked users to show us if they could identify problem areas based on given bulletin information. Uh, so we conducted 46 interviews in Vancouver, Squamish, and Whistler, and we really focused our attention on trying to capture the entire range of experience and activity types. Um, so you can see from our example, we were able to include the sort of harder-to-reach entry-level users, 
Um, we had 14 uh, participants with no formal training, and we had nine participants who either rarely or never use Avalanche bulletins. To analyze this interview data, my colleague Anne conducted an applied thematic coding analysis to try and see what those patterns were and to establish a classification system. And what emerged was a five-level hierarchy that builds in complexity of use, understanding, and application. And before I go into each of these different types, I just want to express how grateful we are to our interview participants for their honest and valuable contributions, um, which I will now share. So type A users are absent, or they do not use bulletin products. They may, however, intercept bulletin information from other sources, like the newspaper, the radio, from trailhead signage, or from social media. And these users had a variety of different reasons for not engaging with bulletin products. Um, either they simply didn't know that they exist, or um, they might not consider them relevant for where they're traveling or for their activity type. Type B recreationists are primarily focused on the danger rating, and they use the danger rating to make go or no-go decisions. They express difficulty um, in using this product to make these sorts of binary choices, particularly for the danger rating levels in the middle of the scale, so considerable danger. Um, so they primarily rely on marked trails or peer recommendations um, or online resources for their avalanche risk management uh, decisions. Type C users are also primarily focused on the danger rating. However, they combine it with a consideration of avalanche terrain exposure to make a decision about where they're going to go. And so in following, they base their field assessments on terrain identification. These users found it challenging to incorporate avalanche problem information, and so they either avoided situations in which uh, they needed to use it, or they deferred decision-making to more experienced travel partners. Type D. Type D users distinguish avalanche problem conditions, and they integrate this information into a comprehensive risk management process that accounts for hazard and exposure. They essentially use the avalanche problem information to open or to close terrain, based on whether or not it's appropriate for travel. However, they may not accurately recognize or evaluate avalanche problems in the field, and so um, they tend to rely more on these predetermined terrain closures than they do on their field observations. And so, in general, they express a sort of lack of confidence in their interpretations. And finally, type E. So, type E extends their evaluation of bulletin information to where they are traveling. Uh, these users are capable of making assessments that are different from the forecast, and they use the bulletin as a starting point for continuous assessment which is how it's intended to be used. They engage in a detailed review of bulletin information, and they really try to tease out the evidence for supporting or uh, not supporting the information in the icons in the bulletin. So what we end up with is a hierarchy of defined ordered stages that build on each other and that progress in terms of the depth of bulletin use, the degree of comprehension, and the extent of information application. This establishes the typology as a stage theory. And what stage theorists recommend we do is we try and uh, seek to understand and explain uh, stage transitions or the barriers that prevent advancement through this hierarchy. What was so cool about this study is that my colleague Anne found an explanatory framework in the field of education uh, called the solo taxonomy, or the structure of observed learning outcomes. Um, this is a well-established hierarchy of learning quality, and it precisely parallels the bulletin user typology, as you can see. So, interestingly, at phase one, uh, pre at the pre-structural level, users are not able to use the products, or they miss the point, or they yeah, simply don't use them. At the uni-structural level, they're able to identify one relevant component or one aspect, and for us, in our context, that's the danger rating. Following, uh, users are able to identify two relevant components and to combine them. So for us, that's the danger rating with terrain. 
At the relational level, users are able to recognize a system of integrated parts. So in our context, that's the avalanche problem information within a comprehensive risk management framework. And then finally, users who are able to extend the subject into a new dimension or to apply the bulletin information to a localized assessment. So this refined perspective gives us a novel way of thinking about the backcountry audience in terms of how they interact with bulletin information. But the identification of these patterns was just the first step. We wanted to see how these patterns were distributed across the broader sample of the population. So in spring of this year, we conducted an online survey. And uh, just with, as with the interviews, we're so grateful for the support that we had from the community. Thanks uh, to the efforts of NWAC and the promotional efforts that they put in, we had nearly 400 people here in Washington alone uh, participating in the survey. Um, and if there's anyone in the audience who took part, we really appreciate your investment of uh, time and mental energy. We know that was no small investment, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, in total, we had 3,214 people completing the survey, um, with substantial participation from here in the US. Uh, around a quarter of our sample were women and three quarters were men. And while we had 2,282 participants that were backcountry skiers or backcountry snowboarders, um, we also made a really determined effort to try and include uh, other backcountry disciplines. Um, so the fact that we have around 150 to 250 ice climbers, out-of-bounds riders, uh, snowmobilers, and snowshoers is something that we're really proud of and something that perhaps this graph doesn't do very well to represent. So we wanted to form a really complete picture of each, of par each participant's uh, routines, their impressions, and their behaviors. So these are the different uh, topics that we included in the survey. So we started with a background review of participants' training and their experience. And we then included some questions which really uh, tried to evaluate the use of different bulletin components. Um, and these questions were structured in a way which enabled us to analyze the depth of users' comprehension in each of these different, uh, for each of these different bulletin products, like the danger ratings and the avalanche problems. Uh, we then asked users about their impressions of how they think others tend to be operating in the backcountry and their uh, typical role in travel decisions. We also asked them about the importance of social media in their uh, information gathering routines. And then throughout our attempts to promote the survey, we really said to users, our message was, this is your opportunity to make bulletin products work better for you. So there were numerous opportunities throughout the survey for users to provide feedback on their experiences using the bulletin. So just to give you an idea and a sort of preliminary insight into what we can do with this data and this information that we've obtained, I'm going to show you the results from some of the questions that we have in the survey. Uh, one of the questions was uh, the danger rating recall question. We asked users if they could type out from memory the danger rating levels in order. Um, this gives a really interesting insight into how people are perceiving how familiar they are with each of the different levels. So the first question we can answer is, what percentage, what proportion of the sample are able to recall all five danger rating levels? And the answer is uh, just under two thirds, so around 64%. Uh, we had around 16% of the sample in this question only stating four terms. Uh, much less than that, around 1% of the sample listed terms correctly, but they put them in the incorrect order. And then we had a whole bunch of other responses, some of which were very telling about how people perceive the danger rating. <laughs> which is quite fun to go through. <laughs> um, another really important component of danger rating perception is, this, is the quantitative interpretation of the scale. And this is something that avalanche researchers have been interested in for a very long time now. Um, so we asked users to place these range sliders to indicate how they perceive the severity of each of the levels. And traditionally, uh, avalanche researchers have generally agreed that avalanche hazard increases exponentially with the danger scale. So a response that's in line with that traditional perspective might look something like this. If we take the midpoints from each of these different ranges and look at the gaps between each of them, you can see the distance increases as we move through the levels. 
However, other studies have suggested that perhaps, quite predominantly, people are perceiving the scale in more of a stepwise fashion, with even distances between each of the different levels. And that might look something like this, if a user was perceiving it in that way. The responses that we had in our survey seemed to fall much more closely in line with this stepwise linear pattern. So this graph shows the quantity of uh, each participant's midpoints placements. It's a bit hard to get your head around. Um, but the size of each bar relates to the number of participants, and where it is on the scale relates to their midpoint in those range sliders. And as you can see, for the tallest bar, it really indicates uh, this kind of stepwise pattern with an even distance between each one. Outcomes like this really help us to think about and to predict how different danger rating assignments are going to be interpreted by those on the receiving end. One final survey question that I'd like to share an insight with you from is this aspect question. So we showed users uh, an aspect icon, and we said, on which aspects do you think the avalanche problem is present? So in Canada, we had around 400 people seeing each of the two representative icons for their country, so each participant only saw one icon. And if we look at the percentage of people that made no mistakes, they selected all of the correct aspects, icon, uh, aspects and they didn't select the ones that they shouldn't have, uh, it's around 81, 82% of people. Here in the US, there was around 360 people who saw the equivalent icons. And interestingly here, um, the same measure is substantially higher, around 94%. But there's another twist in this tale, because initially when we first uh, administered the survey and distributed it, there, the formatting wasn't quite clear, and people weren't seeing how to select their bulletin regions. And so some US participants were being sent through the survey as Canadians, and they were seeing Canadian icons. <laughs> um, and some of the feedback was quite funny from that. But we initially thought this was a disaster and it was going to ruin the outcome of this, of this question and the, and the data. But when we look at the outcomes, we see uh, an accuracy rate that's consistent with the designs and it really highlights the importance of these icons that we use in our products. So how can we translate all these findings into meaningful developments that improve uh, bulletins moving forward? Well, one of the analysis paths that we're currently undertaking with the survey is to analyze participants at each of the different user levels. So these numbers in red show the numbers of people who self-selected at each of the different bulletin user levels in the survey. What we're currently doing is we're using the skills-based questions in the survey to form a much more complete picture of who makes up each of these different user types. And once we've uncovered more about the characteristics and the factors that define each level, and once we've highlighted some of the typical challenges that users tend to encounter with products, the aim is to combine the outcomes from phase one and phase two to inform the development of future products in two ways. <coughs> Firstly, we can, divide, we can design interventions uh, that specifically target the needs and capabilities of users at each level. So if we think about the danger rating, we want to think about this in the context of type B and type C users, because they're most dependent upon the effectiveness of this product. So it makes sense and it's logical to evaluate and improve this product in the context of their decision processes. The second way we can implement these findings is to think about how we can structure the bulletin to facilitate stage transitions. So can the bulletin help recreationists achieve higher information outcomes? Can it help them to learn more? Can it help them to deepen their conceptual understanding of the information? One of the really interesting outcomes that's consistent uh, across both the interviews and the survey is that users were really asking for more feedback that we just heard from uh, Liz. This is really present. They want to know whether or not they are thinking about things correctly. They want to deepen their understanding, and they want those corrective feedback opportunities that are so lacking in the avalanche learning environment. What this all suggests is that we need to re-envision the avalanche bulletin as more than just an information tool and a conditions report, and start thinking about where it should be fitting in within the broader avalanche education framework, about the role that it could be playing in avalanche awareness initiatives, uh, in social media outreach, and in formal avalanche education curriculum. 
This really highlights the unique opportunity that the bulletin gives us to reach a wide-ranging audience on a routine basis. And if we consider the bulletin user typology in this context, we can really start to think about the most effective products and programs for meeting users at each of their individual levels and for helping to facilitate stage advancement too. As a final comment, I'd just like to uh, touch on some exciting projects that are up and coming in my research group. So another really exciting outcome from the survey was that we had 2,943 people say that they'd be willing to participate in future studies, which is a pretty uh, cool resource to have access to. Um, so some of the studies that, uh, and some of the projects that my fellow students are undertaking uh, are to look at the danger rating in much more depth and how people are using it and applying it across both that interview and the survey data set. Also to undertake an analysis of where does social media fit in within the broader avalanche uh, information landscape. And uh, another project which is looking at that um, question of how can we design bulletin products that give users those corrective feedback opportunities that they so want and desire. So if you're interested or would like to get involved, then please stay tuned on our website or on our Facebook page, um, and we will be posting future research opportunities on there. Uh, and I'd like to conclude by giving a special thanks to our sponsors who really make this research possible, as well as acknowledge the First Nations peoples on whose land we have conducted our studies. Thank you. Awesome. We have a time for a couple questions. Um, anybody got one? Or two? Or three? We can do a longer pause. Oh, we got one down in front. Um, we got a mic coming. I was wondering if you guys uh, looked into weather data and interpretation of weather data from the forecast in this. Was there any... An, under, an understanding of weather patterns and weather data and weather terminology? So in the interviews, we did a really in-depth exploration of information sources, and we asked people what sources they tend to use. Um, but no, not within the survey. It was more about bulletin products specifically. Um, yeah. We have a... Deb, we have a person over here. I want to make sure I understood the uh, interpretation of that, uh, the reading of the, the Compass cartoon. Yes. Is a Canadian cartoon harder to read? Is that what that was? Yeah, that's, that's definitely a finding that you could uh, extract from that, I suppose. Um, there's lots of discussion around this, and some people think that because it's raised on a three-dimensional um, platform, that somehow that's causing problems for the visual interpretation. So... That is what we would uh, conclude from that, from that finding, yeah. Hi. Hi. The graph where it showed where people self-identified and the majority were in the E group, Yes. Do you have a graph that compares where you found people to fall versus where they self-identify? Yeah, sorry, maybe a little hard to follow that. It was more trying to outline our analysis path. And um, you're absolutely right in saying, yes, people have self-identified at these levels. And a really interesting question is, do those people who have self-identified at each of these levels, are they able to uphold certain criteria that we would expect for someone who's a D or someone who's a C? And the survey is enabling us to do that and enabling us to identify who the people are that perhaps self-assess as an E, but according to our criteria might come down a bit lower, and the reverse, people who are under, underestimating on their bulletin user type. And so that's, yeah, essentially what we're trying to do with that survey data at the moment. Yeah. I essentially had the same question. It was something like 50% of people self-identified as being the most expert, which is probably not true. Yeah, exactly. And so that's essentially the... Uh, the core of this analysis that we're conducting at the moment. Yeah, you can see a large distribution of people up at the top end, 
this is also perhaps uh, slightly affected by the types of people who are likely to participate in, in surveys, and so that's probably a, an artifact of that too. So. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question. I thought I saw another. Oh, there we go. This kind of builds on what the last, oh, sorry, right here. Oh, hi. <laughs> what the last two commenters said, did you find any participant response bias in your research? Did we find any participant response bias? Like them telling you what they thought you wanted to hear. So, yeah, I, I alluded to this slightly in, our, in the interviews, particularly. We were really um, expecting that people would do what you just described, that they'd sort of say, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, try to paint themselves out as something that they're not, but that we specifically designed the structure of the, of the interviews to prevent that from being able to happen. So the, the start of the interview was just open questions. How do you plan for a trip? What do you consider? And so that didn't really enable people to just cotton onto the terms that we used. We didn't show them the bulletin at that point, so that really helped to prevent that from happening. And the same is true with the survey. Um, we actually had this three-dimensional terrain selection question, and we very specifically positioned that right at the beginning of the survey so that people weren't biased. So um, we were quite consciously aware that that was going to be a force, and you're always going to be dealing with some form of bias, but we, we made our best efforts to reduce the effects of, of bias in our methods. Thank you, Henry. That was great. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you.